you were warned beforehand that my presentation has a lot of heavy topics and one or two graphic images. And that is because I've been dealing with the darkest points of the human story. And so deal with that how you will. Let's get in. <laughs> Our story begins with a young couple. They come from distinct, different communities, but they overcome it. And they start a family farther out into the woods from both communities. And it works for a couple months. And then several men of one of the groups breaks into the residence and murders the man, fatally wounding the woman, and leaves their infant child to starve. This sounds familiar. It sounds like a story of forbidden love in the 60s or 1890s with African American men or women or subjects of lynch lynchings, but this is actually the case of a Neanderthal man 40,000 years ago desperately trying to defend his homo sapien mate from her fellow humans. This will continue. This is a cycle that will continue for many, many years and throughout all of our history. For the next 40,000 years or so, we scrabble around in the dirt. We do our best to gather what food is edible and hunt down whatever we can catch and kill it and eat it, sometimes each other, as archaeology would suggest. But around 10,000 years ago, our, uh, agriculture was developed and fields of grain rose and around these fields, cities, and around these cities, civilizations. One of the first truly efficient and multicultural of these empires was the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And they also happened to be one of the most brutal, and brutal in written history. They conducted thousands of public executions every year. And for the sake of brevity, and you and I, imagine the worst possible thing you can do to a person and then set them on fire. Moving a couple centuries, Rome was founded. And they now are revered for their law, their philosophy, and their form of government that is used by most Western nations today. But they were also notoriously bloodthirsty. Their famous Colosseum was inaugurated with the deaths of 9,000 animals, 2,000 gladiators, over a 100-day festival, to hundreds of thousands of cheering men, women, and children. The foundation and formation of the empire depended on military expansion. The famous Julius Caesar himself conducted what is now thought to be a genocide in Gaul, destroying hundreds of tribal identities by killing one third of the population and enslaving another third. Eventually, the western half of the Roman Empire fell, and Germanic tribes moved in, carving out their own kingdoms. One of these kings in 700s AD, Charlemagne, formed an empire out of the modern day nations of France, Germany, and most of northern Italy. He is revered, revered as national heroes in each of those nations, and not only for creating an empire and for spreading Christianity to much of northern Germany, but the methods in which he used to spread Jesus' word was brutality. To put it plainly, he, in one instance, executed 4,500 Saxon chieftains who refused to convert to Christianity on whenever their city fell. Around 200 years later, this man, Olaf Tryggvason of Norway, who is a king there and a national hero and also a Catholic ordained saint. He spread Christianity as well throughout his nation and used methods of terror tactics and mutilation similar to those of the Assyrians. Now, there's a bit of a contradiction in our story here. These are the periods whenever our moral codes are being written, the foundations of Western civilization laid, and these actions are being committed by men who we see as righteous men. They're saints, consuls, and emperors, national heroes. So to solve this dissonance, I went and looked to philosophy. And what I found is Friedrich Nietzsche. He is a German philosopher who holds the idea of moral relativism. That's mean, that means that one culture's or time period's right and wrong can be vastly different to another's. For example, the Yulin Dog Festival, in which dog flesh is consumed in China, is seen as repulsive in most Western countries. And the consumption of beef is seen as horrible to Hindus. And we like to think that these problems of our ancestors are their problems and don't apply to us. 
So I'm going to bring it into the 19th and 20th century. This is a map of every single lynching that occurred in the United States from the 1880s to the 1960s. Many of these were committed for reasons similar to our first case of forbid forbidden love. And a couple of these, a couple thousand, were a specific horrific phenomenon called spectacle lynching. This is where entire communities in the South would gather and publicly torture and murder African Americans for being African American. The difference between this and the public executions of the Assyrians and the gory displays in the Colosseum is little to non-existent. And moving farther into the 20th century, century, the Second World War is known to be the most destructive event in human history. Left millions dead on both sides, both military and civilian. But after that, we gathered ourselves. We like to think we've been better since then. We formed the United Nations. We try to solve problems with international diplomacy. But the increasingly recent examples of the Vietnam, Yugoslavian, and Iraq war would disagree with 200,000 casualties, civilian casualties, and the last one alone. So the origin of the vehicle of this violence is debated, war. This, it, but I would argue that it is found in our closest evolutionary cousins, chimpanzees. They conduct what is thought to be, what is very similar to our own tribal warfare, as, is, as was uh, observed by Boston Shackelford's anthropological study of modern mobile foraging bands or hunter-gatherer groups. They would isolate and kill individual members of the tribe until they could take their territory. But it's not just our evolutionary outset that makes us what we are. We've been subject to our own genetic manipulation for thousands of years. In the Jhampur district of the Uttar Pradesh province of northern India, a genetic study was condu conducted. They took a cross-section of the entire Indian caste system, which is nominally outlawed today, but still functions much as it used to. And they found that the Kshatriya and the Brahmin caste had a distinct genetic drift from the rest of the population. This means that these two castes, the warrior and priest, respectively, had evolved almost separately alongside the rest of the people. And according to Darwinian evolutionary theory, those who are most suited to their role and suited to their job would be more likely to reproduce and pass these genetic traits that makes them so efficient at being, having a higher capacity for violence and less empathy down to the following generations. This happened for thousands of years across the world because India was not the only place with a, upper, with a warrior upper class. Think knights in Europe and samurai in Japan. So, but it's not just this. We, as a society, would, would create social activities and martial sports and virtual violence that is non-lethal violence that allows us to practice what is essentially war and without any consequences. This can be seen in American football, boxing, Peruvian Tanaqui, and Calcio Fiorentino in Florence. Now, I'm not saying that these cause violence. It's just a symptom of it. But the accumulation of these genet genetic traits and habits might be a contributing factor to the increased amount of homicides and mass shootings throughout the centuries. And that is where my paper ended this summer. But after showing it and reading it, I was burnt out because I just spent 22 pages talking about genocide, war, and the worst parts of people. And so showing it to my advisors, they said, you need to find a happier ending. <laughs> and I, I agreed. And it took me the better part of this year to find that. But eventually, I did find something. Yes, we are animals. And yes, we respond to our base instincts. But the, better, the best things that humanity has done comes from rising above these instincts. Charity, love, and comedy all comes from this. And we are getting better, 
as is shown, millions of dollars are being given to charity every year. True empathy is being taught in education more and more. And we are all becoming more and more connected because of the internet. And we have powerful examples to follow, such as Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, and Nelson Mandela. But it is irresponsible to leave the weight of social progress on the shoulders of these specific heroes. If we want to have any progress, we all have to do our part because hate and violence begets hate and violence, but love begets love. So please go out and do your part, spread love and peace wherever you can. Thank you.